Thanks. Very nice. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Munoz. I c congratulate you on your downward mobility. Uh, but it's, uh, the story's not over yet, you know. I mean, that best-selling book could still be uh, coming out. Uh, um, I do want to thank you for your hospitality and uh, to the, to the uh, um, Federal Society at the law school, to Joe uh, in particular, for your hospitality uh, as well. Uh, the, the actual title of my book, uh, I'll begin with a, a textual point. <laughs> the actual title of the book is, I Am the Change. Colon, Barack Obama and the Crisis of Liberalism. Um, the, the title was suggested to me by my editor um, as, uh, uh, as based on a statement that, is all that, uh, that Obama made. But in the spirit of uh, l'état c'est moi, uh, I am the state, you know, for Louis XIV, there's something, <clears throat> there's something um, uh, haughty about uh, Obama's liberalism and his, his personality, perhaps. Uh, and so we chose that as the, as the actual front of the title, at least. But I had other ideas in mind at the time. Um, I thought uh, with the, the kind of um, forethought that I'm, I'm famous for, I thought uh, Fifty Shades of Obama would be a good title. <laughs> but, but no one at the time got the, uh, the impressive commercial possibilities of such a title. And uh, my friend Bill Vogeli <clears throat> suggested that it should be entitled uh, Barack Obama, What the Hell Were We Thinking? <laughs> well, the, the thesis of my book uh, runs counter to a lot of conservative commentary uh, about Obama. Um, many conservatives want to believe that the president is a socialist or a, a secret socialist, that he's a foreigner. Um, some even that he's a Muslim, um, and quite a few, and, and one in particular, Dinesh D'Souza, an old friend of mine, uh, clings to the thesis that Obama is a sort of third world ideologue, that he is an anti-colonialist, anti, it's hard to say, anti-colonialist at heart, uh, sentiments which he borrowed from his father, um, and from the third, and the third world sort of Kenyan uh, anti-colonial, colonialist ideology that his father definitely did express. Um, but that seems to me quite uh, incredible, really, because there's not much evidence for it. Um, I, I think it's much more likely that whatever anti-colonialist sentiments Obama has, he has because he's a liberal, than that he's a liberal because he's some sort of secret anti-colonialist. Um, it is true that a strain of sort of resentment at the British Empire might explain why he returned one of the busts of Winston Churchill, uh, the one that was in the Oval Office when he uh, succeeded President Bush. He did have that shipped back to, to the British. But, uh, but even so, I don't think you know, the, these third world um, viewpoints explain why he's in favor of national health care why he's in favor of an economic stimulus, uh, why he passed uh, or engineered the passage of Dodd-Frank, or any of the other more typical liberal policy positions that he has taken and that his party has followed him in taking. So I, I think the way to understand Obama is as he understands himself, as a liberal or as a progressive, as he prefers to be called. And so uh, the book is written from that point of view, really, to try to understand Obama through his own writings, his own uh, his books, speeches, and, and interviews, and to see what it means anymore to be a liberal. What does it mean to be politically uh, in favor of liberalism uh, in today's America? The crisis of liberalism in the subtitle of my book uh, it means not uh, a, a crisis in the sense of a comprehensive emergency, but a crisis in the old-fashioned sense of a turning point. Uh, I think liberalism is reaching a turning point in America in which it is possible that liberalism as a doctrine, as an ideology, you might say, is going to go out of business or become something quite different and more radical than it has been before. Obama is, the, in many ways, the latest avatar of liberalism. 
And so the crisis of liberalism is also the crisis of Barack Obama or of his uh, worldview. He's up to his neck, I think, in its problems, uh, both fiscal and uh, philosophical. So let me begin by saying something about what liberalism is. Uh, this is a more difficult question to answer than it might seem. Conservatives in particular have had many um, unsatisfactory answers to this question over the past uh, 50 uh, or 60 years. Um, some conservatives have identified modern liberalism in American politics uh, with the French Revolution or the spirit of the French Revolution. Others have attributed it to industrialization, a sort of a product of the eclipse of agrarian life uh, in America. Uh, many conservatives, Wilmore Kendall and Mel Bradford among them, have identified liberalism with Abraham Lincoln and the anti-slavery cause in American history. And of course, Whitaker Chambers and a few others have identified it with Satan. <laughs> there may be some truth to several of these hypotheses, um, but none of them is adequate. But liberals have had trouble defining liberalism too. I, I think the favorite account, which you can now find in books, many books by Eric Alterman, by Sean Wilentz and others, um, and repeated now by President Obama several times, is that liberalism means nothing more than an attitude of um, bold, persistent experimentation in policy. And this is a phrase from Franklin Roosevelt, Obama just repeated it in his acceptance speech last week. Bold, persistent experimentation. By that he means a pragmatic approach. Uh, finding out what works to cure our social problems. Um, completely unideological, untheoretical, unphilosophical, you might say. Um, in fact, if this is correct, liberalism would be downright conservative, at least in its own mind. That is, all it's trying to do is keep our political arrangements up to date with our uh, society and economy. Society and economy have a lot of problems these days. All liberals are trying to do, they tell themselves frequently now, is just adjust politics so that it can keep up with the racing problems that society and its evolution are bringing to uh, our door. Uh, in this view, of course, it's the conservatives who are ideologues. Um, it's the conservatives who are extremists. If it's the conservatives who have theories uh, in the bad sense of the term, like trickle-down economics and so forth. <coughs> theories that come at the expense of charity or humanity or ordinary morality in many cases. But the liberals' modest account of themselves uh, is, of course, self-interested. It, it reduces the target, as they say, uh, in the military, it insulates liberals from, charge, from charges of radicalism or innovation. To hear them tell it, the alternative to the living constitution, their pet political theory, uh, is a dead constitution. That is, a constitution that uh, never got out of the 18th century world that it was born in. A world that is now, as Justice Brennan famously said, dead and gone. And, if you, and you only have those alternatives, really. You have you know, a dead constitution anchored in the past, time-bound, and ultimately suffocating because the life has gone out of its world, versus a living constitution which is as up-to-date um, as today's newscast, uh, continually adjusted uh, to meet, as I say, these emerging social and economic conditions. But at the same time, Liberals speak of their vision, their values, the liberal project. And so this notion that all liberalism is, is a kind of uh, uh, fast forward conservatism or a slow motion adjustment to changing circumstances can't be the whole truth. Uh, even liberals themselves, I don't believe that it is the whole truth. So if you actually look at American politics, if you look at American political thought, I think it's fairly um, easy to say, and this is what I argue uh, in the book, that liberalism is, as a political phenomenon, is about 100 years old. Um, it emerged in the progressive movement that broke into our politics most dramatically in the 1912 presidential election, 
which was won, of course, by Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was the Democratic candidate, but he was the first Democrat to bring progress to the old Democratic Party. He was the first to really open up the possibility of the, the Democratic Party, which had been, after all, the party, uh, uh, half of which was pledged to the defense of slavery, and uh, the other half of which was a little uh, weak on the question, let's say. Um, it had been a backward-looking uh, states' rights party up until that point, but Wilson helped to show that it was possible for, for the Democratic Party to become the vehicle of liberalism going forward, the vehicle of progress, of forward-looking action, of, a, of a ref an unending reform agenda, all of which I think characterize modern liberalism. Now, um, this phenomenon of, of liberalism didn't happen all at once. It advanced essentially in three waves in our politics across the 20th century. The first wave was the new freedom or progressivism in the Wilsonian sense. The second was the New Deal. Uh, and the third was the Great Society, uh, along with its tragic chorus, the New Left. Uh, each one of these waves set out to transform America, as the name suggests. The new freedom means implicitly the old freedom is now obsolete. You must begin again. The New Deal uh, has a similar kind of meaning, although the term itself is hedged. Um, it could mean either a, you know, playing the same game with a new deal of the cards, or it could mean a new deal, a new social contract, a, a completely new arrangement for America. And FDR played on the ambiguity between the modest and the immodest sense of a new deal. But I think the truth of it, at least the, the enduring truth of it, is probably closer to the second than to the first. President Obama's well-known desire to transform America is really only the fourth installment of this ongoing impulse for fundamental uh, uh, political and social transformation that has already shaped all of the 20th century and is now beginning to shape the 21st. What we can notice is that each one of these waves was halted. Each was a kind of political breakthrough, but not a breakthrough that lasted very long. Uh, by 1920, the original progressivism was, uh, was over. That impulse was spent. Uh, even the New Deal subsided by 1936, uh, and certainly by 1938, as Dr. New Deal took the back seat to Dr. Win the War, as FDR put it. And of course, the Great Society, had, uh, the air had gone out of that balloon, certainly by 1966, and certainly by 1968, when Richard Nixon was elected uh, after uh, LBJ declined to run for re-election. So the fact that, each of, that liberalism is not continuous, but that it has breakthrough moments led by a kind of um, prophet uh, statesman leader in the presidency, um, ought to give conservatives a little bit of encouragement because it shows that liberalism can be halted or at least interrupted. But of course, each time the transformative process resumed in the next generation, each generation sort of had a political breakthrough of its own, and Obama's moment was the moment of liberal breakthrough uh, for this generation. Now, each wave left a, uh, a legacy, and cumulatively, the liberal legacy has had this effect on America, I think, to enlarge Americans' expectations of our politics and to expand the ambitions and the power um, of government. We've had, roughly speaking, 100 years of American liberalism with interruptions. Conservatism as a political phenomenon really came into its own only very late in the 20th century. Bill Buckley founded National Review only in 1955. There was not a, a, a vigorous conservative policy agenda until Reagan's election in 1980. And really, uh, and that didn't make as much progress as it could have because the House of Representatives remained permanently in Democratic hands for 40 years. Never before had one party held the House for that long until Gingrich in 1994 managed to pry it out of the hands of the Democrats and back into Republican control. But you could say, you know, conservatism doesn't really politically come into power until, until 1980, 1994. Very late. 
liberalism had fundamentally changed in many respects, at least, American politics and our expectations of that politics. And it will not be, you, I mean, something that took 100 years to install or to grow in our politics certainly cannot be removed quickly, uh, if it can be removed at all. And those questions of, of political practice are not ones I pursue in this book, but they're certainly ones worth thinking about. If you want to do, if you want to transform liberalism, as it were, re returning the compliment, how would you go about doing that? That's a very serious, practical question. Let me now just uh, very briefly characterize each wave and then come at the end back to Obama and the present situation. And then I'll subside and uh, we can have some questions and answers. All right, putting it schematically, I'd say you can call these three waves um, uh, more for heuristic purposes than anything else. Um, first, political liberalism, that's Wilson. Second, uh, economic liberalism in the New Deal. And third, cultural liberalism in the 60s. And I'll try to show why I think those terms uh, illuminate. Um, the first wave of liberalism brings two new concepts to American politics, which now really are at the heart of political, uh, political debate and political life. Um, the first is this notion of the living constitution I've mentioned briefly. And the other is the phenomenon of leadership. And I want to say something about each of these, the, the living constitution and leadership. Here at the law school, you, you know about the living constitution through the issue of both judicial appointments, where it is usually the flashpoint uh, or at least one of the flashpoints, and through the great questions about how to interpret the Constitution. Um, there are some, not many judges own up to the living Constitution as a jurisprudential approach, but some do, and I think an increasing number do. But for Woodrow Wilson, and the phrase does come from Wilson, um, it meant it was not just a theory of the judiciary, it was a theory of the whole government, all three branches of government, an approach to the very problem of politics. Uh, Wilson was the first president to criticize the Constitution. And his point of criticism was to say that it was, in many respects, obsolete. It was an 18th century document based on 18th century assumptions. Um, and we had, we had uh, learned a lot since it was made, and our knowledge both of human nature and of politics had improved in the interim. So, it had to be opened up. This 18th century straitjacket had to be uh, taken off before America could have a normal political life. Uh, and, uh, and I'll try to characterize what that means. The founders, according to Wilson, didn't understand that human nature obeyed a Darwinian law of change. Uh, and Wilson, both in his professional writings and in his political writings, says that uh, you know, today we must be guided by Mr. Darwin, that everyone speaks about development, change, environmental challenges, and so forth, slow adaptation, and uh, so must political scientists, so must lawyers, so must judges in thinking about politics. The framers had assumed, as he liked to say, a static view of human nature. They didn't realize that human nature, like other parts of nature, was changeable. And indeed, human nature was perfectible in something like the Hegelian sense. He assumed, and he had learned this, and many others, of course, of, of uh, his generation, had learned it from Hegel and many other uh, Hegelian epigones and uh, intermediaries, um, that history was a rational process, a hitherto unknown dimension of reality. History, in other words, was, uh, had a direction. It had a destination, and therefore it had a meaning. History wasn't just one damn thing after another. Uh, it was a series of things that added up to a story about man's own maturation, his coming into his own, coming into adulthood from a kind of childhood of the race. And therefore, um, it's important to be on the right side of history, on the right side of this inevitable, intrinsic, unfolding process of change. Um, if, if you were an actual Hegelian, of course, uh, you, uh, you wouldn't quite say that, because history has an end. 
Uh, Francis Fukuyama has revived our, our appreciation of this, or at least our, our acknowledgement of this concept of the end of what he calls the end of history, what Hegel called the end of history. The end of history doesn't mean that things stop happening. Births, deaths, novels are written, scientific discoveries are made. Uh, but it meant that uh, there were no new principles of understanding, and in politics and ethics, no new account of human nature or of justice. We had a complete understanding of justice readily available to us at this point. So there was no progress beyond that. From a Hegelian point of view, therefore, progress comes to an end, at least in the most fundamental sense. Um, progressives disagreed with that. Um, they thought that you could separate what Hegel would call the absolute moment from the end of history. That is, it was possible to know that history was coming to an end before you get there. It was possible to understand that all political doctrines before this moment were untrue or only partially true. They were relative to their age. Without being already at the end of history yourself, you're close enough to see the errors of the past without being able to see completely the full completion of human civilization uh, that is over the edge, over the cusp of history, but you're close enough to be able to maneuver towards that end. This is where Marx was. Uh, only he thought that to get from where we are finally to the end of history required revolution. The progressives thought we were you know, approaching what might be referred to as the end of history, but their approach was evolution, not revolution and therefore a kind of endless approximation of the end, which meant you never actually got to the end. There was no real end of history in the final sense, although there was a moment when we had absolute truth at our disposal uh, in terms of a knowledge of, uh, of the relativity of all previous truth and of the absoluteness of our um, principles going forward. So, whereas the founders had because they had a static view of human nature and of human rights, advocated a constitution that would be very hard to change, that was made deliberately hard to amend. Because if you have permanent rights, then you ought to have a permanent or near permanent form of government to secure those rights. But the progressives thought that since human nature was evolving and human capacities were only now being fully appreciated, that you needed a much more open-ended government, one that could easily uh, grow and uh, empower new programs and new uh, agencies to carry out those programs. That's the living constitution, uh, one that is open to growth and can burst through that 18th century straitjacket of dogma and doctrines. Now, it's important to point out that the metaphor, uh, the living constitution, is misleading in, in one way, at least. And that is it, living sounds like it's a plant or a growth and that all you need to do is live it alone, leave it alone, and it will carry out its natural development, sort of teleologically. But um, the kind of Darwinism that um, the progressives embraced was not the, that kind of, uh, you might say, um, individualistic or laissez-faire social Darwinism, but the opposite kind. That we have evolved to the point where we can take charge of our evolution from this point on. We understand evolution now and therefore are responsible for our own. And so the living constitution is one that requires continual intervention by experts, by social scientists, by judges and others to keep our evolution up to date, to keep our political evolution in sync with our uh, economic and social evolution. So this is not a laissez-faire living constitution that will, that if left alone would develop itself uh, healthily. It's something that requires um, expert intervention at many different points to direct its evolution. And secondly, I promised you something on the concept of leadership. Um, Wilson and the progressives taught us, taught all of us, to think that democracy needs, requires leaders to lead us into the future, uh, a future that will inevitably be better than the present, even as the present is better than the past. Now, this was a, uh, leadership is not a new concept. I mean, the Greeks and the Romans talk about leaders, 
although I'm not sure they talk so much about leadership. Um, and it is a concept in American politics that was always regarded with great suspicion. Um, the founding fathers don't really speak of leadership. Lincoln and Douglas could have 21 hours of debate without either one bringing up the question of his leadership credentials or, or what it was that made him a better leader or senator than the other guy uh, would have been. Um, and that's because leadership comes from the military side of politics. Um, it suggests following orders. It suggests a sharp distinction between leaders and followers. You know, this is one thing. You, if you want to be a leader, you can't escape wanting to have followers, right? <laughs> this is not much emphasized uh, in our discussions of leadership today, but that inequality is essential to the whole concept. Um, and so the founders were suspicious of leadership because um, they wanted civilian control of politics, not military control of politics. They emphasized the equality of citizens in self-government. We elect office holders under the Constitution, presidents, senators, representatives, but not so that they will lead us, so that they will represent us and fulfill the, um, go, the, the objects of their respective offices. So this emphasis on leadership which Wilson really puts at, at the center of democratic politics, is now taken for granted everywhere in American politics. I mean, you couldn't run for president. You certainly couldn't run even perhaps for city council without you know, boasting of your leadership ability and your leadership credentials. Um, no one thinks to say, you know, I, I'd rather not follow you. Uh, or I'd rather not be a follower of such, um, uh, you know, of such a person. We all, the negative side of leadership, we've forgotten. But Wilson knew it well and knew that he had to overcome the negative connotations of leadership in order to um, rehabilitate it for American politics. And he rehabilitated it um, in general by connecting it not to military operations but to, or to emergencies, exactly, but to the future. He, he, he looked at leadership as a kind of quasi-biblical idea. And uh, I'll flash that out by pointing out the two other terms very closely associated with leadership that he brings to our politics that we still use today all the time. And one is vision. The leader must have a vision of the future towards which he's going to lead us in a democracy. That's why we think we need leaders these days. We need someone who can see a little bit farther than the rest of us can and can organize us to march to that cheery destination just over the hill. <clears throat> this makes leadership into something uh, incremental and into something unthreatening because the future is where we're going anyway. All, he, all the leader is offering us is a greater consciousness of it and greater preparation for it. He can, make it, he can make the march into the future more equitable and more efficient than if we didn't have uh, our leader. But the leader is, in this sense, just a kind of prophet. I mean, God sent a, you know, a, a vision to his prophets who then communicated to the children of Israel. Uh, history sends a vision to uh, the Wilsonian leader who then communicates it to uh, his flock. It's a kind of secularized uh, biblical account of prophecy, secularized and one could say uh, historicized account of it. Now, one kind of, if you look at the Federalist Papers, they talk about visionary leaders uh, occasionally, always pejoratively. You know, a visionary is not someone you want running your country uh, you, or defending your equality or your freedom because you know, visions can be nightmares and visions can be unreal. I mean, you get hit on the head, you see stars. Or if you drink too much, you know, you, you see little pink elephants or whatever. Th this is not the, <clears throat> the sort of sobriety one hopes for from a, from a statesman, from a great political figure. But if you're sure that the dreams you have are of a future, 
and that the future to come is going to be better than the present, then you have no problem buying into visionary leadership. And it's no coincidence that you know, the, the imagery of dreams and of the American dream has become very prominent, much more so than in the 19th century uh, in American public discourse today. We have this, this kind of, of um, addiction to vision and to uh, uh, an insight into a future which we think is knowable, at least to uh, some. Now, um, the, the enthusiasm for leadership was not unique to Wilson. It swept across uh, the Western world for reasons that I'm not going to go into here. Uh, you can have very undemocratic forms of leadership. Uh, I, one should remember, of course, that Mussolini and Hitler both insisted on being called the leader. They didn't want to be called president, king, emperor, chairman. Uh, they were il duce and der Führer. So the leadership principle was something well known uh, throughout early 20th century um, political thought. But Wilson was a, was a genuine Democrat, and he kept the American theory of leadership, his theory of leadership, anchored in the people, anchored in uh, uh, democratic notions. Uh, partly through this concept of vision, which is just of the near future, not a very far, far distant future, an achievable future. But set through the other concept uh, I mentioned that I would uh, introduce, which is compassion. Compassion or sympathy, which is the version of it that um, Wilson preferred, uh, is what connects the people to the leader. The leader must feel an extraordinary sympathy or compassion for his people. His ears must ring with the voices of the people, as Wilson says at one point. And so leadership for Wilson is a kind of a summing up of the felt needs of the people. It's, it comes from interpreting them, not from, some, not from some original theory or thought that a leader is trying to impose on them. And the, the perfect contemporary versions of this uh, are visible in Bill Clinton, you know, I share your pain, which actually Jimmy Carter was the first to say uh, even more unctuously. Um, and, and Obama in his second acceptance speech last week said the same thing or something similar, I share your pain. Right? I share your pain means I'm one of you. I'm vibrating at the same pitch you are. I understand your needs, your wants, your dreams, and I am perfectly qualified to sum up all of those in charting uh, the course for our nation towards my vision of the future, which is, in fact, drawn from all of you. So um, ag again, even conservatives today have to speak as leaders who have a vision of the future uh, and who are contending with uh, liberals for um, for office. This shows you the permanent influence of Wilson in our thought. Now, let me say something much uh, shorter about the second wave of liberalism, economic liberalism or the New Deal. This is the first time when progressivism abandons that name and takes on the name of liberalism. And this was uh, uh, a project that FDR had. He gave six speeches uh, in the 1936 campaign on the subject of why we should be a liberal party, the party of militant liberalism, as he called it. And, uh, and so he, he thought about and spoke about this change of name. Uh, and we can talk a little bit, uh, I think we don't have time now to talk about that, but we can talk about that perhaps in the questions um, uh, after this. But the, the thing I do want to concentrate the contribution of the second wave of liberalism to our politics is the notion of entitlement rights, welfare rights, socioeconomic rights. They go by all these different names. These are rights which FDR said belonged in the second Bill of Rights, a right to a job, a right to health care, a right to a decent house, a right to a vacation from the job, um, all kinds of socioeconomic benefits which he thought necessary for modern citizenship um, or for modern dignity. Uh, together, these new kinds of rights implied a new view of the social contract. Um, the old view, which pervaded the Declaration of Independence, was that uh, individuals had pre-existing rights from God or from nature. And the point of the social contract was 
to find a way to secure these rights to us better than we could do by ourselves. Um, FDR's new view of the contract is well summed up by a line of his from his Commonwealth Club address, that the contract is between what he calls the people and their rulers. And the people agree to give the government power in exchange for it giving the people rights. Now this is a contract much closer, say, to Magna Carta than it is to the sort of Lockean contract that the Declaration of Independence uh, presumes. Individuals drop out of this contract completely. It's the people, a pre-existing people and their rulers who make a contract with each other. The people don't have rights, they have power. They give that power to the government, the government then grants them rights in exchange for that. Social Security, Medicare, you know, uh, unemployment insurance, all kinds of modern rights that the government is the, not only guarantees, but actually creates, generates. Under the New Deal theory, individuals get whatever rights they receive as members of the people or of a subgroup of the people. So all individual rights in this sense are group rights. Uh, they come from the society or the stage of society's development uh, in which it finds itself. But the problem politically is that this leads to what I call the first law of big government. Uh, there's no reason to fear government, no matter how strong it grows, because the bigger government is, the more rights it can give us. So what's not to like? Uh, if our rights are dependent on government, why shouldn't we be? Now, uh, these new kinds of rights, which FDR puts really at the heart of the new American social contract, uh, are very different from the older natural rights that we spoke of before. Um, for one thing, um, it's very unclear who is obligated to pay for these rights. Every right generates a duty. The two concepts go hand in hand. So, if every individual has a right to a job, a house, health care, who is to provide those goods? The old rights ask very little of other people, and what they did ask was fairly well assigned. Don't kill me. Don't steal my property. Uh, don't kidnap me. You know, uh, f don't interfere with my life, liberty, uh, and the pursuit of happiness, or my life, liberty, and property. But the new rights generate much bigger duties, and it's, they're very ill-defined. It's unclear who is supposed to pay for all of these things. Sometimes liberals say it's the rich, but of course everyone knows the rich really don't have enough money to pay for all of these kinds of rights because there's really no limit to what can be called a right or what can be made into a right in this political process. Um, and so often it's, the assumption is simply that the future will be much richer than the present, and we'll figure out how to pay for these uh, soon enough, but that's not my problem. That's somebody else's problem down the line. Uh, practically speaking, um, what these rights do is encourage people uh, to think of themselves as members of groups. Um, and so there's a tendency not only to think of yourself as a citizen of the country, but as a potential claimant of certain rights from the government. You're an old person or a sick person, or you're young, or you're a farmer, or you're a union member, or all sorts of um, subgroups that you belong to can become interest groups in a new kind of interest group politics uh, in American life. And the conflict of interest groups is strangely amoral. Uh, again, there's, it's, it's unclear how you decide whether old people's rights supersede young people's rights whether sick people's rights supersede um, uh, you know, farmers' rights. It's very hard to make sense of this, and typically it's the law of the jungle. You kind of, the, the interest groups check each other in a kind of amoral power struggle way, and, uh, and that, that, that's the equilibrium that one has to live with. Um, finally, the third wave. Um, which is uh, uh, fascinating and variegated and hard to, to uh, characterize. But let, let me focus on 
uh, just one aspect of it, or two aspects of it, actually. Uh, the first is the change from quantitative to qualitative liberalism. Uh, these are terms that Arthur Schlesinger Jr. used. Quantitative liberalism meant um, helping, uh, putting a floor, an income floor under every American so that there was some you know, low standard of living that no one should be allowed to fall uh, uh, beneath. Um, that's quantitative liberalism. To do that, you have to give people money or access to income in one way or another. But you're not concerned about how they spend it. It's theirs to spend. So when Social Security comes, it comes as a check. Nobody, uh, there's no government bureaucrat who comes around to find out how mom or, or grandma is spending the Social Security check. Um, the Great Society aimed at something beyond that. Uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted to out FDR, F FDR, as one of his aides famously said. And the very term, the Great Society, suggests the difference. The Great Society, as Johnson understood it, was a move up from the New Deal, a move up from merely quantitative liberalism. The Great Society wants to deliver on the promise that was always inherent in liberalism, even back to, Wil to Wilson, that there's a right for every citizen to be completely spiritually fulfilled, to live a quality life, a life of authentic freedom. In other words, it wasn't enough just to try to meet the body's needs politically without also treating the state of the American soul. Uh, you've got to round out and lift up the American way of life if you're to um, have done your duty by it. Now, um, liberals always have been impatient with American culture from the very beginning. They've regarded it as too self-interested, too greedy, uh, too egoistic, too individualistic. Um, from Wilson and John Dewey on, they've charged uh, Americans with being excessively individualistic and not sufficiently attuned to the needs of the social whole, um, to the poor, to the sick, to the sad, as Walter Mondale once put it. Um, but liberals used to attribute this failure of empathy uh, to America's ruling class and its capitalist dogmas. Take Charles Beard, for example, classic progressive historian. Um, his argument was uh, that the Constitution represented a kind of oligarchic counterattack against the democratic spirit of the revolution, against the democratic sentiments of ordinary people. So finance capitalism, big business, and so forth, for him and for many other generations of uh, American liberals, represented the corruption and betrayal of the promise of democracy, of the common man's democracy that the revolutionaries in 1776 thought they were fighting for. But in the 1960s, cultural liberalism greatly expanded the indictment of the American soul. It wasn't just the elite's fault. It wasn't that the elite were vicious and then they corrupted everybody else. Um, it's the people themselves who were corrupt, the majority. And the typical indictments express the, the widening uh, of the, uh, of the uh, target. The people were racist, sexist, imperialist, homophobic, and so forth. One could put a lot of adjectives uh, onto this indictment. Um, and this was not something, this was not a trick played on them by their rulers. This was who they were. This was the true American character. This is why America had to be spelled with a K, you know, in the, <laughs> in, in the eyes of some in the 60s, like as in KKK. Now, this, this um, turn against democracy itself, or at least against the majority, was partly a reaction to the South's massive resistance to desegregation. No doubt about that. Uh, I mean, it was it, uh, it televised and brought into your living rooms. <clears throat> it was ugly. And it was popular. I mean, these were majorities in the, st in the, in the states of the Deep South, uh, solidly democratic majorities, one could say too, uh, with a big D, uh, who were prepared to break the law in order to affirm 
um, uh, their segregated society. But it was more than that. It was mostly an academic expression of just how disappointing and backward Joe Sixpack and Joe Churchgoer turned out to be. I, I, you may know Bertolt Brecht's famous line about, uh, you know, we've, we, we need to elect a new people. <laughs> because the people have failed us. Uh, the people have disappointed us. We've shown them the way, but they did not follow. And they are culpable for that, for not, not following the path to the better future when they had a chance to. And then when the American people elected Nixon, and then elected him by even larger margins against the sainted McGovern, um, people on the left, not all, of, not all liberals of course, but people on the avant-garde left and, and, uh, and their fellow travelers, um, thought that those results spoke volumes about just how sick American society had really become. It wasn't just the Vietnam War that was the problem, it was the war machine as many call it. That is the whole civilization that backed the war that was the problem. And when liberalism turned on the majority, the majority turned on liberalism. And that's what happened to Johnson and that's what happened to liberalism for several decades until we come to Obama. And let me now say just a, a, a few things in conclusion about him. Um, a lot of conservatives think Obama is, uh, you know, not very bright, uh, not a very interesting thinker, um, that he's a product of the Chicago machine, and so forth and so on. I think he's very bright. I think he's very intelligent. Um, and he taught law for 10 years at the University of Chicago Law School. I don't think he's bright necessarily just because of that. Um, uh, but his, uh, his books and his speeches have a kind of literary uh, shine to them that's quite, quite interesting, quite individual, it seems to me. Um, and, and I think conservatives make a mistake in underestimating Obama, both as a politician and as a, uh, a political thinker. I don't, I don't claim by any means that he's an original political thinker or a, a, a very a, a deep um, political thinker, but he's a very intelligent political man. And, uh, and he, he, we ignore what he's actually written and said at, at uh, our peril. Um, Obama confronted the, the legacy of the 60s. And one other important political legacy, that of Ronald Reagan. From the disintegration of the left, on, uh, of the American left in the 1960s, and then the triumph of conservatism, more or less, uh, in the, in the so-called Reagan Revolution, many liberals came to the conclusion that the Reagan Revolution was here to stay. The country had permanently moved to the right. Uh, the center had moved to the right. All parts of American politics had, uh, to some degree, moved to the right. And the only accommodation possible for liberals was to move to the right as well. And this was the Clinton administration's eventual decision to triangulate, uh, to, uh, you know, to ask only for small ball political change and to embrace the new uh, market-oriented, centrist, uh, center-right political culture of the country. Obama never agreed on that. He thought Clinton had sold out liberalism that uh, due to his personal failings and his intellectual mistakes, uh, Clinton had prematurely compromised with uh, conservatives. Obama thought all along that the Reagan revolution was not permanent, uh, that it, uh, it was generational and it could be re reversed by a new liberal upsurgence uh, that he, as it turned out, could lead. Uh, and he thought that, uh, so you'll never hear him say, for example, that the era of big government is over. That, that was Clinton. Whether he believed it or not, he said it. Um, Obama would never say that. For Obama, the era of big government is not over. The era of growing the state is very much here. We're in the era, perhaps, of bigger government, not just big. But we're, we, we can never, because of the nature of liberalism, there will always be subsequent breakthroughs in which the state and its ministrations will grow larger and more powerful. We just have to believe in the possibility of progress. And so the, the somewhat vacuous character of um, Obama's slogans in 2008, hope, change, we are the change. I mean, 
these, you know, these, these monosyllables, which uh, uh, were some, you have to admit were somewhat mysterious. I mean, hope for what? Change of what? To what? I mean, these things lacked you know, objects, subjects, other grammatical parts, which uh, usually are thought to give meaning to such words. I'm not sure that Romney is that much better. I mean, if you saw his convention, he had, he had two syllables, believe. <laughs> Signs that said believe, yeah. Now that meant believe in America, that's his slogan. But of course, even that is, that's at least a little uh, something, there's something there that one can, some particularity one could point to. But what Obama was trying to do in 2008 was to revive progressivism by reviving the belief in progress. To revive liberalism by reviving the possibility of, of, of sudden, intense breakthroughs um, uh, in political and social terms. Uh, that a new, a new New Deal was possible. That a new great society was possible. And before he could bring it about, he had to use his uh, gifts of speech, his rhetoric, to persuade people that this was possible, that they could believe again in the promise of liberalism, that it had not been discredited either by the conservative uh, revolution of, led by Reagan or by the internal problems and, uh, of liberalism that became uh, critical in the 1960s, the, the, the internal disarray that liberalism fell into. Um, and so he was trying also, at the, at the same time, to use R Richard Rorty's terms, to bring the academic left and the reform left back together, to bring the intellectual left and the, the practical Democratic Party regular sort of liberalism with many programs of uh, change and reform to reunite them as well. Um, so he took us in a, in, a, in a very brief time. The first two years of his term were the years of breakthrough. Um, he got a, a large national stimulus bill passed. He got Obamacare, above all, and he got the Dodd-Frank uh, financial regulation uh, bill, another massive uh, uh, leg piece of legislation through. And this was like, this was his 100 days. Uh, this was his breakthrough. Then came 2010, a sharp electoral repudiation. And so now we face in 2012, of course, the acute question. Obama has moved American government sharply to the left, even as the 2010 elections moved American politics briskly to the right. And which direction are we going to go now is really what the election of 2012 um, is about. It's not, one doesn't know, of course, whether how it will come out or whether its, uh, its outcome will, will, will be unambiguous, let's put it that way. But it is, I think, the, the direction, the, the, the problem that the country now faces. Why is this a crisis of liberalism? Well, for two reasons. Uh, as I said at the beginning, a fiscal and a philosophical one. The fiscal reason is that because it is so easy to manufacture rights in the socioeconomic sense, uh, and, and it is hard to say no to pressure groups that are asking for favors called rights. Uh, the, the, the commitments of the government, the promises made by the government have swelled enormously. And it simply is impossible or nearly impossible to pay for them all. Um, this is uh, the crisis that we can see to some degree already in Europe. It's also a crisis looming in the United States. Uh, we can't pay for all the promises generated, much less those yet to come. A and what can you do if you are liberal under those circumstances? Because the problem is not just fiscal, it's moral. That is, and this is a problem not just for liberals, but for every American. Uh, these are promises that have been made to people. They have paid taxes, you know, for Medicare, for Social Security, and soon for Obamacare, for these benefits. And they are entitled to these benefits. They've done their part, as we have defined it, and now they ask quite rightly and justly, where, where's the benefit? Where are, my, where are the programs that I was promised? Uh, so this is a, a crisis of public credit in both senses of the term uh, that uh, you know, Hamilton exploited, for example, in his famous reports on public credit. It's a moral question. Can you trust the US government to keep its promises? And, it is, and can you believe in the so-called social contract that has been written anew, 
um, by liberalism? And secondly, can you actually pay the bills? Can you pay the people whom, uh, whom you owe? The second part of the uh, crisis of liberalism is, as I said, philosophical. Um, and that has to do really with the um, influence of postmodernism in contemporary liberal thought. Um, Richard Rorty, whom I mentioned before, is, is a sort of a, a one of the princes of this kind of liberal postmodernism, uh, famous for arguing that uh, liberalism uh, is relativism. Liberalism acknowledges the truth of relativism, that there's no basis out there for our moral or political judgments. There's no truth in our moral and political judgments, not in nature, not in God, not in history. In nothing outside of us is there a kind of uh, objective basis for distinguishing right and wrong, just and unjust. Um, and so liberalism doesn't rest on truth. Liberalism is the acknowledgment of the relativism of all views plus um, liberals' own uh, um, distinctive value, which is a horror at the humiliation of any one human being by another, an aversion to cruelty, as he calls it. That's what liberalism now is, at least in its most avant-garde uh, academic members. Uh, liberalism it knows it's not true, knows it's not universal, knows it rests only upon the values of liberals who, in, who, who are free to insist upon them, uh, know that no, liberalism knows that its own aversion to cruelty is not backed up by anything else. Uh, they assume, of course, that conservatives are patrons of cruelty <laughs> and lovers of cruelty, um, but there's no argument against that, except that it violates their passionate sense of um, their, their empathy with, the suffer with suffering human beings. Their pity, sort of a Rousseauian pity for other human beings who are made to suffer, made to feel like they're second class by a ruling uh, class. Now, Obama is not Richard Rorty, and he's certainly not a consistent postmodernist. But neither is he an old-fashioned uh, liberal simply, I think. Um, he does talk like a progressive. He, he calls himself a progressive. He believes in progress up to a point. But he doesn't have the faith in progress and the confidence that science and sort of a rationality supports progress, I think, that previous generations had. And uh, you can see this in what he says about truth and absolute truth uh, in his book, The Audacity of Hope. Uh, in a chapter on values, uh, he discusses the Declaration of Independence and the anti-slavery cause and the Civil War. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, an amazing discussion, which I don't have time to, to, to reproduce here. But what he says is that the, um, the founders themselves taught us not to believe in absolute truth. And he seconds this uh, proposition. Because absolute truth leads to intolerance, which leads to um, oppression and cruelty. Now, at the same time, as he says that, um, he says uh, many things, of course, that make you believe that, like any decent person, he believes that slavery is wrong and that freedom is right and that that distinction is absolute. That's not up for negotiation. Uh, it's not relative. Uh, that's true. The civil rights movement was on the right side of history and the right side of morality somehow, um, he thinks. But how do you square those two ideas? And the answer is you can't, uh, and that he doesn't. And in his mind, I think there is a great deal of confusion on these ultimate kinds of questions. And so he's left <clears throat> at the end of this discussion saying that um, even if he, he discovers that even his distrust of absolutes is not absolute. And... <laughs> uh, and what he says is that sometimes um, the absolute values or the absolute will of, of one individual is the, is the only thing that stands between us and, um, 
uh, injustice or hypocrisy. But whether that man is John Brown or Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis or anyone else uh, is left open as a kind of awful existential question. Um, and the president is, you know, he's in this terrible fix of believing that there's no such thing as absolute truth and that that's absolutely true. Anyway, uh, to the extent that that confusion becomes shared, that will be an increasingly important part of the crisis of liberalism. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. themselves as leaders are contributing to the problem rather than to uh, a solution. Um, well, uh, it's like most such dilemmas in politics, um, uh, you know, in the long run the answer is yes, but the problem is the short run. Uh, because you, you know, you do, we do want conservatives to get elected, let's say, um, let's stipulate that. Um, and to some extent they have to as Reagan did, uh, compete by explaining why their leadership is going to be superior to, another, to the other guy's uh, leadership credentials. But to the extent possible, I think we need to try to transition from leadership to statesmanship, or back to statesmanship, and back to the Constitution. I mean, from, from an old-fashioned point of view, the job of the president, the most important job and the central job of the president is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States period. That's the oath he takes. It's not to lead the people into a more glorious future. And to the extent that we can restore a kind of constitutional focus to our political appeals, I think we can restore some sobriety to American politics and also some democracy to American politics. Because you know, it's one thing to elect the president um, to do the job that the Constitution prescribes for him. It's another thing to elect the president to satisfy our desires for you know, this glorious future. Um, okay, so th this question, did you all hear that? Okay. Um, if you go back to FDR, who began the revolution in our government of you know, building the welfare state, it was very crucial that he called these new rights a second bill of rights. That implied that they were you know, co-equal with the old rights, and also that they were or should be somehow really part of the Constitution of the United States, just like the Bill of Rights is part of the Constitution of the United States. Now, he never pressed for these rights to be turned into articles that could then be you know, ratified and added to the Constitution. So these were um, always an informal addition to the Constitution. But the whole point of comparing them to the first Bill of Rights was to suggest their permanency that these things were so important, so fundamental, 
that they were as if they were part of the Constitution and, and we were pledged to them as we were pledged to free speech or to freedom of religion. And just as you don't ask, you know, how much are we spending on freedom of speech this year? You shouldn't be asking, how much are we spending on uh, the right to a job or the right to health care this year? Uh, because these are matters of right. These are not matters of expediency. But of course, because you don't actually fund free speech, but you do have to fund a, me a medical care system and, an, and a system of public insurance and whatever, uh, you have to ask how much it costs. But liberals never really confronted that problem. Uh, and so it, you could say um, uh, that amid all of the flux of the living constitution, in which every institution seemed to be changeable, um, FDR tried to carve out a space where there would be some part of, of the living constitution that would be permanent, that you could rely upon forever, and that was going to be these new rights assimilated to the old constitutional provisions. Um, but now we face the problem that uh, if you really can't pay for them, uh, what do you do? Now, as a matter of constitutional law, um, I mean, it has been so far determined, at least by the court, that these are, in fact, programs created by mere statute law, and the statute law can be changed at any time by an act of Congress. Uh, there's been at least one Supreme Court case several, uh, several decades old now on this question. So as a matter of law, there's nothing that would prevent a Congress from radically cutting back or ratcheting down any of these social welfare programs. Uh, the problem is uh, not the legal one. The problem is the moral one. And that's the dilemma that we're, we're in. I mean, now you have to begin to talk about limits, you know, and, and to explain that the power to grant a right includes the power to um, restrict that right. And Obama is the first liberal president to face the problem um, that the right to, and it's very interesting to see him grappling with this, that the right to health care also means the right to limit access to health care. You know, after all, he sold Obamacare as a program, as a way of cutting down costs in the health care market. We would bend the cost curve down as well as expanding coverage. And the reason why people never quite bought it was it seemed impossible. How could you expand coverage and at the same time reduce the costs of the program? And that is, in fact, that's, I mean, that's the, the problem that Obama cannot solve. Uh, at least so far, and that it would be hard for any liberal to solve. Uh, you could, and therefore, what do you have? You either have a, a real crisis uh, at some point, or uh, you have, um, well, you have a crisis either way, I guess. You either have a re renunciation and repudiation of promises made, certainly at least a modification of promises made, um, or you, you have to Swedenize the American government. You have to move from a government that, you know, a federal government that now spends 22 to 25 percent of GDP lately to one that spends 35 or 40 percent of GDP in order to pay for that. Uh, and if you do that, then this is a very different country. And, uh, you know, the, the, the work ethic, the rate of business formation, all kinds of measurable things will change, as well as uh, spiritual things, I think. Charles Kessler's book is on sale uh, right outside in signing copies. I'm sure there are more questions, and I'm sure he'll stick around for And there are more answers. To sign notes <laughs> and to 